We all want to make a positive impact on the world, but what do we have to experience to get there? This is Stripped Bear FM, where our shared stories of strategy, raw talk, and real people uplift and inspire you. Now, welcome the host of Stripped Bear FM, Catherine Contos. Hello, everyone. When food becomes both what you love and hate, and the struggle brings you to thoughts of suicide, how do you tip the scale and shift your mind to make food your ally? Today on Stripped Bear FM, we are privileged to speak to David Roden, the co-founder of Accountable Life Group, personal trainer, and the author of Drop the Baggage. Let's take a moment right here to inform my listeners that they can benefit from learning different strategies on scaling both their life and their career by booking a quick consultation with me directly via my site, katherinecontos.com. Now back to our guest. Welcome, David. Are you ready for some raw talk? I am looking forward to this. Thank you for having me on here. David, at a very young age, you tipped the scale at 400 pounds and pondered the thought of suicide. Tell us a little bit about how you grew up and your relationship with food bringing you to the moment where you finally shifted your mindset to have food work for you, not against you. Yes. So... It's very interesting because you would expect, as I as I kind of convey my upbringing, this doesn't even make sense. Uh, my dad's actually an interventional cardiologist. He's so he deals with heart attacks and and stuff like that. Uh, my mom's a nurse. I grew up inside the medical field. I was pre med in college, and I had my EMT license as well back in the day. And you would think from that medical upbringing, I would be in a position of being fit, being healthy, and everything else in between. Um, but that was not the case. Reason being, when you start to look into how I was brought up, I have a special needs brother. This is kind of the, the sequence of events that brought about my early childhood obesity. He just took a lot of energy. He had a lot of anger issues. Um, and so I took full-time access for my, my mom. And then my dad working 90 plus hours a week as a, as a doctor in the hospital. Um, it kind of just put me in a position of all right, David, here's a credit card. We're busy with, with Rob. You go do what you need to do. <laughs> All right. And what do most 12 to 18-year-olds want? Food and video games. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there was no real check. Yeah. And so um, I kind of just like slipped through the cracks. And by the time I was 13, I was over 300 pounds. I was pre-diabetic. Had, I had high blood pressure. And by the time that all hit, it was so it hit so quick in reality. Like it finally hit my parents like, Oh my gosh, like what, what is going on? And by the time at this point I went to a endocrinologist, I was going to doctors to kind of figure this out. Cause through my dad's lens, it was like, okay, my son's 300 plus pounds at 16, 15 years old. What is medically wrong with him? Right. And so I did get like a brain scan and interesting part of it all is I did have a cyst on my pituitary gland. Um, which is in the brain, and they kind of floated there for a few years, actually disappeared. However, it's even funny, and this is the whole thing within the medical industry and just people in general, they always try to figure out to the best of their ability what they think is going on when they have no idea. <laughs> and instead of saying, we have no idea, they kind of start putting labels to it, which can be dangerous. And I remember my, I was like 15, 16 years old, and I had my endocrinologist tell me, you know, David, this may be just the cards you were dealt and we may be able to put you in the Sahara desert and you may not lose weight. You hear that at 15, 16 years old and you're, <laughs> this doctor has no idea I'm eating a Costco size bag of Reese's every day, 24 count every single day. And you know what? I'm sure your parents were probably thinking too at one point, you know, like when they saw you getting bigger, oh, he'll grow, you know, it's a growing thing. Mm -hmm. And when he grows up, as he's getting taller, he'll probably just, you know, take it in height and lose the weight. And then you must have been like now 16, 17 and really tipping the scale. Yep. And they're going, okay, this ain't growing out, right? Exactly, exactly. And so they were just, and, and it was interesting because I mean, you have my dad. I mean, he, I mean, he's, he's an incredible individual, extremely smart, ex extremely supportive. 
But the reality was he worked a lot. I mean, that's just there wasn't the, the classic dad's home by five o'clock and you're having family dinner together. That, that just didn't exist in my family. And so we had sometimes weekends and then we had longer, more extravagant vacations. But dad just worked a lot. And then mom had full time focus on my brother because his anger issues and everything like that. So it was it was just like the perfect storm. I, I often kind of convey this message of especially when it comes to obesity and anything in general, really, there's a lot of reasons why people get off the track mentally. Like, is it sometimes a catastrophic emotional event? Maybe like an uncle does something he shouldn't or like a family member dies or some kind of catastrophic event happens. Yes, that is obviously a possibility. Um, But some people, it's just, you know what? They just didn't think the actions they were doing were important enough and they did just zoned out. And before they know it, they're 400 pounds. And they're like, what just happened? <laughs> right. So you're just saying what happened to you was you were eating and sitting, eating and sitting, playing video games and you grew. You didn't, you, there was nothing medical other than the cyst in your pituitary yep. gland. There was nothing besides that really wrong with you other than the diabetes, which was brought on by your obesity. Correct. It was just that sequence of events and, and, Never having, yeah, I just never had the tough love of, you know, David, you're done eating candy or, hey, that's not healthy. You need to go for a run. Well, let's go for a walk or something. Now, my dad was still a support system at the time. It was like, all right, I'm 17, 18 years old. You go through phases of like, hey, I'm going to get my health together. And whatever program that I wanted, my dad would buy me. So say if it was P90X or Jenny Craig or whatever it may be. I'd be like, Dad, I, I think I'm going to do Jenny Craig. Okay, cool. What do you need? Here's a card. Go get it. Like any resource to help me and support me, like go give me a trainer, whatever it may be. But that's that's where it's so interesting is because as things progressed at 18, everything kind of was just falling apart. And my body was getting really bad. I was going to a chiropractor two to three days a week for my back because it was just all in shambles. And I wasn't sleeping very well, and so my grades were plummeting, and so hitting, like, <laughs> it's actually kind of funny. So I was in the golf team as well, which was the the spring of my senior year, and I always portrayed as a super intelligent, had my life together kid from the outside perspective, but the inside I was just, if, you, if, if anyone actually looked, it wasn't good. But no, but again, it just, you kind of fall through the cracks. Um, <laughs> my senior year spring, I had a 1.2 GPA. And my, my, my coach didn't even check my grades because he just thought I was the smart kid of the group. Wow. But it just – but that it was, it was a lot of just like I, I put on a good mask, but the reality was I was not in that place. And as things were kind of falling apart, both through an educational perspective and my health, I mean I just felt so trapped because – I mean y- your dad's a heart doctor. Your mom's a nurse. My uncle's a very prestigious lawyer. And I'm maybe not even going to go to college and I'm 400 pounds. Like, all right, my life's over. <laughs> that's that's what was going through my head. And it, 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 it put me into an extremely dark place where I just saw more pain in my future of disappointing others, disappointing myself than anything else. And even death for that matter. And that's why there were two occasions on my senior year of high school where I seriously considered never fully attempted ending my own life. And thank God I didn't. And I kind of lived that life until I was 22, actually. Uh, I got, I actually did get into college and I lived still the obese life until I was 22. And that's when the, the shift happened. And I can kind of go into that in a little, little future. And how were other relationships, like other relationships with other children when you were growing up with girlfriends? Like what were your relationships like in general, socially? Mm hmm. So I was actually the most outgoing kid out there. Like that that was my way of portraying this. I had it all together. I was the funny fat kid that everyone knew. High schools in my district. So we had probably 4,000 kids between all three high schools. There's no question. I was the most well-known individual kid of the entire district. Why? Because I was going to all the school events. I was going to everything, acting like the funny fat kid. And so when it came to relationships, everyone loved me because I was just the kid that made everyone smile and mm-hmm. laugh. And and uh, I put on that that good face of what people because it, it really came down to since I didn't really respect myself and love myself. I was like, I need it from other people. 
And so I really craved friendship from others because I didn't, well, I wasn't even a friend to myself. And so that's where, I mean, I was extremely well known in, in when it comes to friendships and relationships to everyone because of that, actually. Well, at least you had that, right? So mm -hmm. what happened? What was it that brought you to the point of suicide? Was it because your image was now not the way you wanted it to be? Because now you were thinking, I'm not going to make it to university. I'm not losing the weight and I'm going to disappoint everybody. Was Did it become more of an external reason rather than? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So for me, it was, it, it really just came down to, I just saw no way of getting out of this. All I saw for my future was more disappointment, more not living up to what what is expected of myself and of what I'm doing. And thinking about losing 200 pounds just seemed so impossible that I was like, well, my life's over. What 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 what's what's living this life for the rest of my life cuz I can't get over it. I've, I've tried this, I've tried that. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. Maybe this is the way it's going to be and maybe I'm just better off not here because I don't see anything else being good in my life. And the reality is that's what's so fascinating about the mind and how the brain works is the fact that in reality, if you if I look at my life growing up, it was almost as perfect as you could ask. I mean, resources wise, I mean, my dad was making 600,000 a year support system wise my mom and dad are incredible human beings. Like they, they're incredibly supportive, giving. My dad's always been the, Hey, follow your passions. Don't worry about the rest. You don't have to be a doctor like me. He would say these things to me, but I didn't hear them because mm -hmm. I put this lens on everything of being such a failure. And so it, it is so interesting how you, it, as cliche as it sounds, you really do create your own reality and you can have such blessings around you, but not see them because of how you twist, how you twist perception in your own brain. Um, and that's what I'm so fascinated about today with what I do. Exactly. It's all about perspective. Sometimes, you know, we just cannot, especially when, when you're in that dark, dark place, you know, you just cannot see what other people see. You just see what you want to see and what you want to feel. Tell me that, what was it that kept you from doing it? I have no idea. I just couldn't get myself to pull it. it for me, it was uh, the, the two incidences where I was, <laughs> I laid in my custom marble shower, which is hysterical to think that's the, the way I was living. And I had a pair of scissors to my wrist. I never actually cut my wrist physically, but I would be just sitting there looking at it like, just do it, just do it. I never did. What the reasoning is, God, I don't know. It just wasn't in my cards and I just never fully went through with it. Okay, when was the time that it shifted for you? When was that that aha moment, that moment where you said, "I'm that's that's it, I'm doing this." So it's actually interesting. So I kind of got out of that super dark low, but I didn't actually transform myself until I was about 22. And I kind of convey this message of people make drastic change from one of two places: either inspiration or desperation. Most people, it's desperation. They get a heart attack and it's there like you got to stop being this living this lifestyle or you get diagnosed with diabetes or you get diagnosed with whatever or you get in a big car accident, some massive emotional event that makes you desperate for change. And mine was actually inspiration where I hit my junior year of college, junior, senior year of college, and I decided med school wasn't for me just for reasons of time and where I saw my life and what I wanted to do with it. And so I was in this transfer, like transformational stage and I started hanging around these kids that were big into business and self-help and personal growth. And they gave me a book, The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. And that book just kind of simplified things for me. And it's funny because like the, the whole book you can read in a half a day and on top of the fact that it's a, such a simple message, but again, life doesn't have to be complex. And the profound statement to me in there was like, all right, you have these massive goals. Well, that's great. So like losing 200 pounds, the reason why I never did it was because it sounded and felt so big that I never would actually really try because if I tried to emotionally invest into it and I failed, it felt 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. So I just never tried. And it's like, okay, how do you lose 200 pounds? If you lose two pounds a week, in 100 weeks, you lose 200 pounds. 
And I was like, oh, okay. Right. That, that, that makes sense. And so literally all I did for the first 50 pounds of my weight loss, I just, just hyper-focused on two pounds a week. I was 4'10", and I was like, okay, next week I'm going to be 4'08". And then I was 4'08". And then next week I was like, okay, I'm 4'08", I want to be 4'06". And then 404, and then 402, and then 400. And I literally hyper-focused week to week on just two pounds a week until that 50-pound mark. And the 50-pound mark was when I like I looked up and I just burst into tears. <sighs> and I was like, I'm changing my friggin' life. I'm yeah. changing – my physical life, my mental life, my spiritual life, I'm changing everything because it, it ahad me to the whole perspective of your life is what you make of it, not any specific situation you're in. I was like, if I can lose 50 pounds, I can lose 200. If I can lose 200 pounds, I can become a billionaire. And if I can become a billionaire, I can change the world. Right. That 50 pound mark was a real catalyst for me into my entire shift that I've done through now. See, people don't realize that the little wins need to be celebrated. And th that's how you get to the big win. Literally, you talk about celebrating little wins. So I got into Neurolinguistic Association, a lot of neuro neurolinguistic programming in this time period, too. And <laughs> it, it is crazy how you, you, you have to treat yourself like a child, even at 40, 50. It doesn't matter where your brain is just it's a very simple thing. And if the way I always explain it is, OK, if you if you have a child, and every time they do something right, you go, good, you should. And every time they do something wrong, you smack them over the top of the head. What is the kid going to do? The kid's just going to do nothing because mm. it doesn't know good. It only knows if you do something, you're going to get destroyed. And so like when I was in my senior year and I was really starting to get into the mindset of change, I would at the cafeteria with my friends around, I'd be eating like a chicken salad or something. And I would literally stand up, give myself a high five, and then sit down. I'd be like, good job, David. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and I literally would do that. I, I would be my greatest cheerleader on every single win, whether that win was a nutritional win, if that win was a workout win, if that win was a scale win. It didn't matter what the win was. I celebrated them just as much. I, I was hard on myself when I made mistakes, obviously. Like, you need tough love. But I think one of the biggest shifts for me was when I started to be my greatest cheerleader and would give myself the positive reinforcement when I was doing the things right. Right. It's all about self-love. That's when you do love yourself is through the hardest times. Mm -hmm. That's when you need to love yourself even more and not be harsh on yourself and judge yourself and just, you know, hurt yourself in ways just because, you know, just because today was a bad day or just because you had a bad moment. And I'm so glad you got that clarity and you were able to transform your life. It's been a fascinating experience. Like, honestly, like looking back. I, so I was actually with some um, some old high school friends last night and just conveying to them because I think especially weight loss and like what you were saying, I, I loved how you preface the show when it comes to dealing with food, people that deal with weight issues, because obviously genetics plays a role. We all have friends that can eat pretty much whatever they want and they stick between 20 pounds of their ideal body weight. Don't you hate then, them? Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> They're, my roommate in college was a marathon runner and it yeah. was not even fun. Like the, the kid could obviously worked out, but the kid literally ate two large pizzas every day, every day. Wow. And, and, it, and he just that's and he had abs. And I'm like, this is shenanigans. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a cup of ice cream and I blow up like a balloon. All right. But. What most people do, especially – and this you can portray this in any big massive change. Weight loss is just one of them, especially when you have to deal with food for the rest of your life. It's not like being a drug addict where you can just say, hey, I'm going to stop doing drugs. It's like you still always have to eat. And so being able to mentally shift compared to most people, what do they do? They just white knuckle a diet plan. They just, all right, I'm going to go keto for the next six months. And then, yeah, they lose 60 pounds, 80 pounds, 100 pounds in six months doing keto. It's an effective program. But you're not dealing with the issues. You're not dealing with how do I sustain and look at food differently, not just how do I white knuckle a goal. Because as soon as you hit that goal, you're going to go retract right back to what you were because you didn't set in a standard of lifestyle, of sustainability. You just white knuckled a goal. And it's like there's a difference. So what have you done since you lost the weight? I don't know how many years it's been. How long has it been since you've lost the weight where you reached your goal? Mm -hmm. So I went from so from 22 to 25, I lost the 180 pounds. 
And then I had two skin removal surgeries in when I was about 25, 26. And then from 25 to now, I got into bodybuilding and competed in my first bodybuilding show back in November. And I got down to 212 pounds and I was about seven, seven to 10 percent body fat. And in that sequence of events, the most fascinating part was I've done intermittent fasting, extended fasting, calorie counting, macro counting, keto. Uh, I've done low carb. I've done paleo. I've done. It's fascinating because guess what? I pretty much have done them all except for vegan. And they all work. When you learn sustainability, I kind of break down the way I break down food and nutrition a day is into five parts. Number one is hydration. Drink mm-hmm. a gallon of water a day. Period. End of discussion. It's it's a very simple thing for the. I don't care how overweight you are or how unhealthy you are. Drink. It's simple. Did you drink a gallon of water or didn't you? There, there's there's no questions to it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's a great place to start. Number two is calories. You have to know it's it's like you can't break science. If you're taking more energy than you expel, it's going to be stored somewhere. So calories is next. But obviously, calories aren't the end-all be-all because if all you're eating is carbs and you're not eating protein, your body's going to wither. Mm-hmm. And so next thing is macros. I, I understand how macronutrients work. And the, the easiest way for the average person to understand is – Focusing on a higher protein diet, you just feel fuller longer. It's for it's a better for metabolism. So just focusing on a high protein diet is the thing I work on. Then after that, it's micros, making sure I get micronutrients in. So my my metabolic systems, all that my endocrinology is working effectively. So get your fruits and vegetables in. And then finally, timing over your eating. So if you're doing all the rest of those things and you're trying to enhance your weight loss or you're still in an issue. You're eating the calories you want. You're eating the macros you want. You're getting the hydration you want. You're still not seeing the goal. So like say if you're like a type 2 diabetic, getting into extended fasting, intermittent fasting to help with cortisol issues and insulin issues and all this kind of stuff that also play a role in general wellness and weight loss. So that's like my, my sequence when I'm working with anyone. It's like, okay, are they getting a gallon of water a day in? What's their calories at? Where are their macros at? Where are their micros at? And then what timing of their eating is where they're going to be long term. That's kind of the long short term of how I look at nutrition today. <laughs> so, this is during weight loss only or is this something that they would have to sustain counting and looking at everything every day? If you're at your goal weight and you're sustaining it, you don't have to look at it as long as you're there. Um it's it's what I always call like uh, you're unconsciously competent. You're unaware that you're just doing the right things. There's some people that they don't think about what they're doing. They're just doing the right actions. And so you have to know if you're not doing it right, you have to first know where you're wrong. But once you understand it day to day, I don't weigh my food anymore. Day to day, I don't think about am I drinking a gallon of water a day because it's become so habitual that I just know I do it. Now, if all of a sudden I gained a bunch of weight, I'm like, okay, where's my problem? Is my calories? Is it, where's my issue? But once you actually get to the goal and it's just sustainability, I just be results focused, which is, is my body weight near where I want it to be? Is my body fat near where I want it to be? And that's all I look at. It all depends on where the goal is. Is your goal just to create a, be within 10 to 20 pounds of your ideal body weight living just a healthy lifestyle? Or are you trying to get shredded based upon what your goals are? Obviously there's going to be a different intensity to your nutrition plan. So tell me what's a day like for you? What does it look like? So in just when it comes to nutrition or just entirety? Just your day with, yeah, food, exercise. What, what would that look like? Yep. And so for me, I do intermittent fasting. So my eating window is noon to eight. I, I just, I feel good that way. I've done small meals throughout the day. I enjoy just more nutrient dense meals in a smaller period of time. And so I wake up between seven and 6.30 and 7. I go for a half hour walk fasted. And then I go, <laughs> I wish the gyms were open because I go to the gym, mm-hmm. but I'm in Michigan and all the gyms are closed. <laughs> so my, my lifting consists of push-ups, pull-ups, just anything I can basically do. So basically I break down physical, mental, and spiritual in my first two hours in the morning. So getting that cardio of fasted cardio in, getting that workout in, I usually meditate for 15 to 20 minutes and then I read or listen to an audio for 30 minutes to an hour. That's my morning routine. Amazing. Isn't sleep a key component? It's huge, right? Yeah, I, I get a solid, I, get, I do a solid seven to eight hours. I don't, 
this idea of because again sustainability I've, I've done the four hours five hours like when i was in college oh my gosh i did actually have to deal with that because i was i mean i was i was a pre-med biomedical science degree so i was doing 18 hour credits of heavy biology all these labs everything going on while going to like while everything else is going on i'm losing 100 plus pounds so I'm, I'm in the gym for an hour to two hours a day on top of the fact that I'm doing everything else I'm doing in my life and creating, I was burned the, the wick at, at both ends for a little bit there. Yeah. Um, but I, and looking back on it, it's like, no, sleep is so important to get this idea of white knuckling things is just so dangerous. Um, you can do it for a while, but sustainability for 70 years, not a chance. Exactly. And you know, I find when I'm not sleeping, like let's say I had a bad night, I didn't sleep. I'm just looking for carbs and I'm mm-hmm. snacking, snacking. I just need that. I'm looking for energy and I'm, I'm yep. looking for it through food. And that also happens when I'm stressed. So I know those mm-hmm. triggers. Those are my triggers 100%. when I'm eating and that make me eat more. So definitely uh, an issue for, I think, a lot of people, right? If they're living a high stress life and they're not, because usually that correlates with not sleeping well, anxiety, you know, yep. sometimes, and then it falls into depression. And then it's just this crazy circle that continues going on and meanwhile you're either some people lose weight but most people gain weight mm-hmm. because yeah, cortisol of i mean yeah. when you get into the whole cortisol and how it affects joints and body fat it, when you're stressed out and your cortisol is the stress hormone and when you're stressed out and that cortisol goes to the roof i mean i talk about in my book it binds it makes it very hard for the body to metabolize fat when cortisol levels are up and so you wonder why, like, I'm, I'm trying so hard to lose weight. I'm not. And that's where I go back to this idea, like, you get these very overly simplistic, it's, it's a double-edged sword, because I want to keep things simple enough that the average person can understand. But then the body's not just some simple thing either. And so being able to convey a message where, yeah, being stressed out can actually make you fat. And you're like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that's actually like when your stress hormones are through the roof and your your fat doesn't want to metabolize out because you're stressed out and the, your body just holds in material when you're stressed. Yeah, you got to learn how to relax. You got to learn how to calm your brain. You got to learn how to cleanse your body. Those are real things that you have to learn if that's your struggle. Like that's where knowing kind of like the five areas, it kind of you can pinpoint where people's issues may lie then. Oh, it's just calories in, calories out. Like, <laughs> come on, just just eat less, Sally. Like, right. come, come on, it's it's a little more than that. When I haven't slept and I'm stressed out, I don't care <laughs> about calories at that day. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, I need energy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, David, I know my listeners would love to know even more about you and your strategies on how you made it through adversity to success. So let's take a quick peek and fast track through some questions. Are you ready? Fire away. Okay, so quick answers. What is the one thing you are most excited about today? I'm excited. I'm doing, this is my second of three interviews today. And so I love it. I'm excited. I I love to communicate. I love just to create value for people. And if one thing I'm saying is, is, does resonate somehow transform their life because of one statement I made, like so many things happened to me, I'm like, sweet. So that's honestly the most exciting part of my day today. That's my hope too, for somebody to get something out of this that just like, propels them to losing weight or inspiring them somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, Share with us your one personal habit that makes you successful and keeps you inspired. I write down my goals. I keep everything in front of me. And not only that, I compartmentalize my goals because I I really want to live a rounded life. For me personally, it's not about being the most shredded of all time. It's not about being the wealthiest of all time. It's about living the most diverse total life I can live. And so I always break down all my goals and all my daily habits into six areas, physical, mental, spiritual, relationships, community, and money. And so like based upon those six areas of life, which is pretty much all of life, it's like, okay, did I call my mom today and tell her I love her? Did I do this? And I set those daily habits and rituals that keep you accountable to a, to a full, healthy, rounded life. Amazing. What book would you recommend to our SB listeners and why? I think you already mentioned it, but if there's something, that one or another one? Actually, I would say my number one book is The Essential Guide to Neuro-Linguistic Programming. Okay. And I'm trying to remember the name. It's a purple book. It's on Amazon. I can't remember. It's like a tri-author book. Um, it It was a recommendation book by Tony Robbins. What's really nice about it is it's a full 
it it goes into the, the how your mind works and how you create habits and how you create belief systems. And more than that, it, it's even a business book. It gives you effective ways of dealing with confrontation. Okay, so now for a soul shaker question. If you woke up tomorrow and you were stripped bare of everything in your business and only had shelter, food, and your family, what would be the first things you would do in the next 30 days with only $500 in the bank? I would speak to my family and speak to the community around me, whoever that may be, and I'd ask them what are their biggest needs. And I would figure out what the biggest needs of the group, like of my family and of the group around me and just create value. And if you you help enough people get what they want, you get whatever you want and more. Amazing. Very true. David, on a last and final note, what's the one takeaway message my listeners need to hear from you today? I would say the number one message would be who are you and who do you want to be? And there's a difference. And acknowledging where you're at as where you're at. And getting to the point where you can become anything you want to become if you just change certain aspects of your life, I don't care what it is. If it's physical, if it's mental, if it's if it's financial, if I can go from a place of literally as, as dark of a place as you can get because of my physical limitations and able to lose around 200 pounds competing in a bodybuilding show in a matter of less than a decade, it just proves to me that your current situation means nothing compared to where you can finally be in your final destination. Mm. Yeah, perfect. David, thank you so much for all that. You know, uh, I know you just launched a business. Can you tell me quickly the name and what you guys do and what's the best way to connect with you? Yes. And so the name of the company is Accountable Life Group. We just launched in the last about less 35, 40 days. Uh, the base we start with is a podcast and we're also building a unification community where everyone can just share their value and their experiences of how they transform their bodies and also their minds. It's a discord server. We'll put in the link below and it's just a low ego group of people all just trying to help each other hold accountable to their daily habits in life. And it's a good mix. It's supporting people who need to be supported, but also not being a pity party either. Like we've dealt with some people that they just want to, they want pity in the group and it's like, no, 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 no. We want to help you change. And sometimes that means confrontation. Sometimes mm. that means tough love. Um, and so we're building that community out. That's, so we have a Discord server and then our YouTube channel. Amazing. And they can connect with you on what site exactly? You can actually, you can do my email as well. My email is fit, F-I-T, D-R-O-C-K, D -R -O -C -K, at gmail.com. Perfect. Thank you, David, for sharing with us your strip bear story. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode of Stripped Bear FM. Start living your best life. Head to katherinecontos.com for more information and resources, as well as ways to connect with Catherine directly. That's available exclusively on Catherine with a C, K-O-N-T-O-S dot com.